Exactly. Okay, so there are a couple of really good problems on the exam that I'll be happy to discuss in greater detail once you've all had a chance to look at your exams and digest the comments. The difficulty, you know, with teaching a class like complex analysis is there's so many good things for us to discuss. We have to pick and choose. So what I think I'm going to do this year is spend a little bit less time on the Riemann mapping theorem than I did back in 2010 to free up a little bit of time to do quantum mechanics, which I think will be of interest to a lot of people. And so we'll spend a little bit less time, but we'll still do enough to get, I think, completely sick of real analysis. Unless you decide this is how you want to spend your life. And that's one of the other reasons why I'm spending at least a week doing the proof of the Riemann mapping theorem. Is I want you to get a real sense of what is it like to do these very technical arguments. Alright, so what we're going to do first is we're going to start off with some basics on what are conformal maps, do some examples, and then if time permits, try to figure out what the key theorems might be and whether or not there's a difference between complex analysis and whether or not there's a difference between complex analysis and real analysis. And of course the answer is yes. No, no. It's more enthusiastic than that. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, conformal maps. So, let's say we have open U and V, holomorphic map, F from U to V, F is 1 to 1 and on to. So the following is not the fault of complex analysis. The following is the fault of other analysts. We have lots of different words for these things. What's another word for one-to-one? -one? Uh, injective. injective. What's another word for onto? Surjective. Surjective. Okay. And if you're both injective and surjective, then you are bijective, bi right? And so you can see why that's much better phrasing than one-to-one -one and onto, because you have you have injectiveness. Okay. But of course, when you say one to one, that really drives home what you're talking about. Right? No two points are mapped to the same point. And then the onto is everything is hit. So I actually like words like one to one and onto. I'm probably not supposed to as a pure mathematician, but you know, they're far more descriptive form. So if this is both, we say it's bijective. And in in this case, we say F is a conformal map from U to V. Okay? So that's the situation. Not surprised that holomorphic has something to do with this, right? We're studying holomorphic functions in this class or functions with a pole. Makes sense. If we're talking about mapping from region to region, we probably don't want to have a pole unless we look at the extended complex plane where we would now have the point at infinity. The one-to-one -one and onto, these are very nice conditions. You, know, you give me a point in V, there's a unique point in U that's sent to it, and no two points in U go to the same thing. So we can also say U and V are conformally equivalent. So, how many of you have taken abstract algebra? And in the interest of full disclosure, let the record say or state my hand is not raised. I have never <laughs> taken abstract algebra. <coughs> did, did, didn't Yale require it for a math All right, this is being recorded, so I have to stop now. We can talk about this after the class. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think the statute of limitations has expired. And if not, limitations involves analysis, not algebra, so I should be okay. <laughs> All right. <coughs> so, I've taught abstract algebra twice, if that makes up for it. Yeah, I, I teach it very analytically. And so I actually like this section of the course because I get to do algebra, but from a very analytic perspective. So I am priming you by mentioning words like abstract algebra and putting it on the board right now. What should you be thinking now that we have conformal maps from U to V? So one thing is, do we have an inverse? 
what do you think the answer is? Yes. And it's also conformal. So maybe we'll prove that now. And what, it seems to make sense that we should have a conformal inverse. The difficulty, what's the difficulty in proving the existence of a conformal inverse? So again, this is forcing you to recall some of your results from your analysis. I'm giving you a one-to-one -one onto function from u to v, and I want to prove that that's holomorphic, and I want to prove that there's an inverse and that it's holomorphic. Okay, so it might not be a bijection. So if we have one to one and onto, does that imply that an inverse exists? Inverse might not be holomorphic. The inverse might not be holomorphic. So that's the difficulty. The difficulty is the inverse might not be holomorphic. But there has to be an inverse. So if you think about it, here's u and here's v. Okay. You give me some point here in v and I can find some point in U that's mapped to it. And every point in V is hit. So I have a function F that takes me from U to V. I now need to find a function that goes in the other direction, that takes an input in V and gives me something in U. So there's a very natural candidate for the inverse function of G. G of V is the unique U such that f, well, I'll say that, is equal to v. Right? And because f is onto, every v is hit, and because it's one-to-one, -one, there's a unique thing going back. So the inverse for g exists. And now we just need to prove that it's differentiable. And so the book goes through the proof. It's essentially the chain rule. You, once you have f of g, you can get differentiability. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of the proof, it's in the book. We do have inverses and the inverses are conformal. If you had to choose any V to study, what would be the simplest V to study? So, U, right? I've got a map from U to V. And I want to just find U. Are U and V conformally equivalent? <laughs> what is the easiest V to show is conformally equivalent to U? U, right? And if I gave you, you know, some other V, I have no idea. So the easiest case is study V equals U. Say F is an automorphism. Or if you want a conformal automorphism. <clears throat> so why is it easier to study maps from U to U than maps from U to V? here, right? No matter what u is, can you give me an automorphism from u to u? Hey, the set of automorphisms is not empty, right? One of the big questions in the subject is, if I give you two sets u and v, are they conformally equivalent? Can I find an automorphism mapping the from u to v? Well, if v equals u, yes, it's not that hard. You could have done that you know, years ago. So u to u exists the identity there's another reason why it's nice to study maps from U to U. Let's say I have F and G are automorphisms from U to U. Can you give me any other automorphisms from U to U? I'm sorry? The composite. So are F composed with G and G composed with F. 
<coughs> because they have the same target space, I can keep composing. If I was over here and I had general U and V, if I had F and G, well, I won't use F and G because let's use the letters. If I had A and B from U to V, can I compose A and B? No. Can you think of some way to try to compose them? There is something you could do that would allow you to combine them. Could you try restricting the... the, the you want to keep the entire depth, right? Yeah. Okay. You can compose like A, B, and this. Excellent! Excellent! So you could look at A composed with B inverse, or B composed with A inverse. Then that makes sense, because B inverse will map us from V to U, and then A will take us from U back to V. Oh, so where does A composed with B inverse live? I'm sorry? It's a map from what to what? I'm sorry? V to V. This is from V to V. And B composed with A inverse? So this becomes good ways to combine things. Now, of course, the question is, hmm, do I still want to compose functions by f composed with g, or do I want f composed with g inverse? Maybe that's the more natural thing to do. And so it's still the right definition to do f composed with g. That's still the thing you should be looking at. But what I hope this example illuminates is that there is a chance that this could have been the more natural way to combine two functions. Okay, so what do you study in abstract algebra? <coughs> Abstractly, right? Yeah. You know, you're supposed to help me out. I haven't taken the course. Groups. <laughs> groups, thank you. Okay. So you're studying groups. So what's a natural question to ask now? <coughs> Yeah, are the automorphisms a group? Are the automorphisms of U a group? So abstract algebra is not a requirement in any of my classes. Is there anybody here who has not taken abstract algebra? Okay. Are you planning on taking abstract algebra at some point? I mean, I had to say yes when my professors asked me. <laughs> so, there are, I think Professor Stoichu is giving a talk on family days on the Rubik's Cube, which is one of the more interesting examples of a group. And so if you haven't taken abstract algebra, I strongly urge you to go and listen to the talk. If you have taken abstract algebra, I also strongly urge you to go and listen to the talk. All right, so a group has four properties. The first is closure that if you start off with two elements in the group and you combine them, you stay in the group. So, if I start off with f and g, so we'll always let f and g from u to u be automorphisms. So is the composition of two automorphisms an automorphism? Yes. So you need to check this. It's basically just a function of chasing through the definitions. Because f and g are both injective and onto, their composition is injective, their composition is onto. What's the one thing that we have to check very carefully? Holomorphicity. Holomorphicity. Well, the composition of differentiable functions is differentiable by the chain rule. So it's closed. Uh, there's probably a canonical ordering of the four properties. I always forget it. What's another property we should have? I'm sorry? Non-empty. That's actually not a property. Inverses. Inverses exist. Inverses. So, given f, uh, we know f inverse exists, is holomorphic, we're fine. 
And so again, this is basically tracing again the definitions of one to one and onto. Because f is one to one and onto, its inverse is one to one and onto. <coughs> By the chain rule, f is differentiable, f inverse is differentiable, inverses exist. We need two more properties. Associativity. Associativity. So we want f composed with g composed with h to be f composed with g composed with h. For the most part, associativity almost always holds, and you just write a check mark. Okay. What should you really do if you if you really cared about abstract algebra? I'm sorry. Yeah, check it. All right. So you really should check it. Just trace through all the definitions and show it works. There are a few situations where associativity fails. And so if you go from the reals to the complex, how many of you have seen the quaternions? So associativity, I believe, fails for the quaternions. And if you go up even higher, oh no, I'm sorry, oh, no, commutativity. Really. Commutativity fails for the quaternions, but not associativity. If you go up to the octonians, then you lose associativity. Okay, it's very scary to have something where how you place parentheses matters. Okay, there is one property that's missing. The identity. The identity. There exists an identity. So can somebody give me an identity? The identity, thank you. F of z equals z. So it turns out that the set of automorphisms is a group. And this is actually very useful, and in a lot of situations we can explicitly write down what the automorphism group is. So the whole idea, why do we care about all of this? Uh, how many of you are studying physics again or something like that? Have you solved you know, differential equations for like some cylinder with charges or something like that? And they prescribe the boundary values and you want to see how things happen? So what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to say this problem is equivalent to this problem. And then you do some kind of change of variables and you reduce what you're studying to something you've previously done. And the whole point of all this conformal stuff is to map from one region to a region we already understand. And that's really what's going on. That's one of the reasons why people care so much about this. As uh, most of you have not taken physics, I'm not going to spend too much time on the physics applications. But this is something that you should be aware of in the back of your mind, that this can be used for solving problems like this. <coughs> so we'll skip the section on the Dirichlet boundary problem. We've seen a little bit of stuff like that when we did some of the Cauchy formulas, that if you prescribe a holomorphic function on a nice boundary, and the interior is uniquely filled in. And so, a lot of this stuff is very similar. So let's say we want to study conformal maps from U to V. It turns out this is an extremely important thing to do. And I will try to motivate this a little bit later with some stuff from number theory. Um, let me just explain a little bit how we can do this, and then I'll try to throw in a little bit of motivation without going too deeply into number theory as to why we care about this. Okay? Instead of studying maps from U to B, what would you rather study? Or... Yeah, you'd rather study the maps from U to U or from V to V. You don't want to study maps from U to V. So we have the following. We have the automorphism group of U. We have the automorphism group of V. Do we have a group of maps from U to V? If so, it's not given by multiplication is not given by composition. Because if we have f and g map u to v, the composition does not exist. So we would have to do something strange. So the question is, what goes in here? And so what I want to do is I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about this problem and why we should study this, rather than just jumping to the answer that's in the book. Okay? So let's think. We have the functions f and g from u to v. There's two other functions you immediately know as soon as I write that. Okay, which functions are? 
Once I give you f and g, you know two other functions because these are conformal maps. They're inverses. And so f inverse and g inverse are from what? B to u. So can you give me a good combination of these four functions that I should study? There are two good candidates. Or if you do things the opposite as I do, four good candidates. If I look at f inverse g, I start with something in u, map it to v, and come back to. If you flip it, then you go from v to v. I'm sorry. If you flip the order, it would go from v to v. So if you had uh, g composed with f inverse, it would go from v to v then. Okay, so so if I look at this, g starts off in u, gives me something in v, so this gives me a map from u to u. Okay. And I could look at, you know, the other way around. I could look at, you know, G composed with F inverse, sure. I want to study maps from U to V. This is not a map from U to V. Can you do one of F or T again and map it from U to V again? Okay, so what should I look at? So tell me what to look at. No, you look at F. You need to tell me what composition <laughs> to study. Oh, I meant like paint, or consider f inverse composed with g at one function. Right. And then compose it with f. Excellent. So let's look at f inverse composed with g composed with f. So I'm trying to convince you that this is a natural thing to do. Uh, the, hmm? Oh, it's going to map from let's see, g. u to v. Right? Okay. I think well, it be f of f inverse g. So that won't work. But isn't taking like f of m, f of g is exactly the same as what we did before? Mm -hmm. It just seems kind of complicated. Right. So if I, if I try to put in another f here, I can't have f and g following each other. Right? And so whenever I have one function, I have to have the inverse of the other. So I could look at um, f composed with g inverse, and I'd map you from where to where. So, I have maps from u to u, I have maps from u to v. I have a map f from u to v. And so the interesting thing is, if I compose f with g inverse, where does this map live? It's from v to v. So, f composed with g inverse lives inside the automorphism group of v. Or oh, another way of looking at it is f is an element of, I think, g composed with the automorphism of v. Take an automorphism of v, a very specific one, and then compose it with g, and you'll get back f. What this is telling us, so again, yes? Doesn't g have u as its domain, and the automorphism of v has g okay, as its sorry. domain? Um, G inverse, you go from Oh, sorry, this should be automorphism of U. Sorry, thank you. Right. F. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh no, okay. F composed with G inverse from V to V. Okay, that, that's right. Okay, so, so let's, let's do this very slowly. So, F composed with G inverse at Z is some H of Z where H is in the automorphisms of V. Okay. So what I want to do is I basically want to relate uh, certain sets. I know I have an automorphism from U to V. I have an automorphism from V to U. I now know F composed with G lives in the automorphism of V. And if I do the other way, F inverse composed with G, let's call that K of Z, and where does K live? Automorphisms of U. So the question is, how much can F and G differ from each other by? 
what I want to do here, I have f composed with g inverse evaluated at some point z. And z lives in v. So if z lives in v, I could replace this with, you know, say, g of w. Let z equal g of w. Then f composed with g inverse of g of w, what would that equal? It would just be, well, f composed with g inverse composed with g of w is just what? f of w. But on the other side, I would have h composed with g evaluated at w. So this tells me if I have two functions f and g that are conformal maps from u to v, they're almost the same function. The difference between f and g is just an automorphism from v to v. And you could go in the other way around and get it um, as an automorphism from u to u. So essentially, if u and v are equivalent, if u and v are conformally equivalent, what do you expect is true about the automorphism group of u and the automorphism group of v? Same size. Same size. More than just the same size, though. Isomorphic. Isomorphic. That you give me anything in the automorphism of u, and I can give you something in the automorphism of v, and vice versa. And so, if I look at this, uh, I have the natural thing to consider is f inverse composed with h composed with g. Where does this live? So g requires me to start in u, gives me something in v, h takes v to v, and then f inverse takes v to u. This is a map from u to u. This is an automorphism from u to u. So this gives me a way to, you know, to conjecture what is the relationship between automorphism of u and automorphism of v. So this is an element of the automorphism group of u. So I would expect that if I take the automorphism group of u, this is equal to f inverse automorphism group of v times g. So this would be a very natural conjecture to make. Does that seem like a reasonable conjecture? If I have an automorphism in here, if I have some h, we've just shown this is going to give me an automorphism of u. So everything in here is going to be contained in here. Is it equal or isomorphic? Uh, technically should be isomorphic. They, because they live in different places. And so this is telling me, in fact, it's explicitly constructing the isomorphism. You give me an element of automorphism of V, this is the corresponding element in the automorphism of U. I've only done one direction. I have to do the other direction as well. And so I'll leave that as an exercise. So the, yes? Is it like commutativity messed up? Shouldn't it be F inverse automorphism of V? Oh, I, I, I just wrote it down wrong from here. I'm sorry. I just copied it incorrectly. Sorry. So what we've just shown is everything in here is basically associated to something in here. All we have to do now is show that you give me something in here and I can find something in V. So I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Uh, abstract algebra is not a prerequisite for this course, either as a student or as an instructor, and so I won't go into too much more detail on that. But I wanted you to see some of the connections. And I wanted you to see the different ways to try to combine things and see which should we look at. And it takes a while, but eventually you realize, well, if I have these maps between U and V, and between V and U, I can conjugate. I can somehow take something in the automorphisms of V and move it to the automorphisms of U. Why is this useful? Depending on what problem you're studying, there might be different symmetries. And depending on the symmetries, you might want to 
use one coordinate system rather than another. A prerequisite for this class is multivariable calculus. Okay? If I give you a circle, what coordinates do you want to use to integrate? <coughs> Sorry? Almost surely polar, right? It's hard to imagine a integration which is going to work out nicer in Cartesian than polar coordinates if I give you a circle. Is it possible? Yes. I can really rig and come up with one. But for the most part, if I give you an integral involving the circle, you want to use polar coordinates. It's the natural way to attack the problem. What often happens in complex analysis and number theory is different regions are more natural for the domain of definition. And because of that, sometimes it makes sense to look at the unit circle. Sometimes it makes sense to look at the upper half plane, or a quarter plane, or a quarter circle, you know, all these different things. And the big Riemann mapping theorem is going to tell us if you have two simply connected sets that are not all of C, then they're conformally equivalent. So, this is the goal. The Riemann and so while we've been using Cauchy's name a lot more than Riemann's name, we're going to spend so much time on Riemann's mapping theorem that it's going to almost balance things out. So UV open simply connected not all of C then conformally equivalent. Often take V to be D, which is the set of all Z, absolute value of Z is less than 1. Fine. So the standard thing is to show that everything that is open and simply connected and not all of C is conformally equivalent to the unit disk. So whenever you see a theorem and you see conditions, your first thought should be remove them. What happens if I remove a condition? In general, two things typically happen. The proof is either much harder in general, or it fails. it fails. So, let's remove some conditions. What's a good condition to remove? Not all of C. Not all of C. So imagine F from, from C to the unit disk is a conformal so the, C, so the whole complex plane and the unit disk are conformally equivalent. Can somebody give me a contradiction? <coughs> Why is this bad? Is it possible for C to be conformally equivalent to the unit disk? Well, B is just, B is just a boundary. Well, no, no, no. Let's go back to real variables. Can you come up with a map G from the real line to the interval minus 1, 1? So can you give me a map from the real lines to minus 1, 1? Minus one. Uh, that something like that should work. So let's see. Um, there's lots of ways to write it. I mean, I'll draw the function. Here's one. Here's minus one. If I take a function like that, it will work. Can anybody think of a function that looks like this? Something along octane will work. Now, what's the octangent of infinity? So I want sine over cosine to be infinity. What's my angle going to be? Over two. 
So if I multiply by 2 over pi, this should work. So I've just created a map that takes the real line to minus 1, 1. Don't tell me the reals can finally do something that the complex numbers can't do. So can I conformally map the whole complex plane to the unit disk? I just did it. Is this function infinitely differentiable? <clears throat> yeah, the derivative of arctangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. That's a nice function to differentiate. So here you go. Infinitely differentiable map from the reals to minus 1, 1. Don't tell me the reals beat the complex for once. So what would happen if I had a map from the complex numbers to D? What could you tell me about the range or the output? So if there existed such a function, what would be true about the output? I'm sorry? Magnitude one or less. Ah, the magnitude would be one or less. So I have a function from all of C. Oh. Oh, oh and now I'm hearing some oh. oh. <laughs> this is like, it's like a wave at a baseball game. <laughs> Maybe I feel like Victorino will talk this about it, propagating this way. All right, so what's the word? Leoville. No, Leoville. Right? Leoville tells us if you have a bounded entire function, the only bounded entire functions are constant. So if I could map the entire complex plane to the unit disk, that would violate Leoville. Okay, what if I throw away just one point of C? So, study C minus the origin to the unit disk. Could I do that? Now, what condition does this violate? So, this is not something connected. And the reason is, because I don't have the origin, if I give you this path, I can't shrink it down to a point. Or, another way of looking at it, is if I choose this as A and this as B, I cannot deform from this path to this path because I'm missing the origin. Alright, so, Does the Riemann mapping theorem prove that such a function cannot exist? No, good. So why does it not prove that such a function can't exist? Because it's not if and only if. So this is one of the most common mistakes people make, is they assume that if is the same as if and only if. This is just saying if these conditions are met, then you have a conformal equivalence. It's not saying that the only time you have a conformal equivalence is if these conditions are met. Now, what would you like to be true, if and only if? So that's something to think about. If your region is not simply connected, um, well, as soon as it's not simply connected, are we, miss we have to be missing at least one point in C, and so we're no longer all of C. So really, the only issue is if we drop the simply connectedness. So what about the following? Could we have a map from C minus 0 to D? Yeah, could, could I come up with a holomorphic conformal map from C minus a point to D? I've got to map some point in C to the origin. I've got infinitely many points. I've got entirely many points. Okay, it's not such a big deal. But yes, I do have to find something to go to zero. So what are the theorems do we have that might be useful in a case like this? I could, I could easily change it to C minus any point by just a translation. So that's not so important. What if I 
could extend my function to be to all of C, what would then be true? <coughs> so imagine I could extend my function. It's initially only holomorphic on the punctured complex plane. What if I could extend it to be holomorphic everywhere? What would I then be able to conclude? Map can exist. Why? We just showed Liouville. So, under what situations could I extend a map from C minus a point to all of C? Removable pole or something like that. So let's think about what's going on. The function is holomorphic. So, here's the complex plane. Here's the origin. Here's somebody who has an allergy or cold. Okay? And we're going to remove them. <coughs> Okay. Uh, it worked, see? <laughs> right. What do we know is going on in the neighborhood of the origin? Do we know anything? Can we say anything about values of the function in small, some small neighborhood? Bounded. They're bounded. Why bounded? It's mapped to the disk. So all this stuff here is bounded, right? See, initially, this could be mapping it all over the place. Maybe I have the function 1 over z, which is taking stuff close to the origin and, you know, spewing it far out. But it's bounded. Is this enough to get a removable... Is this enough to give an extension? Wait, so the theorem is open mapping. So one of the big issues in using things like the open mapping theorem is to make sure all the conditions are satisfied. So I'll let you think about the, the rest. So we know it's bounded. We know we have an open map. We know it's holomorphic. We know it's continuous. The issue is it's not initially defined at this point. So can we do some kind of continuity argument to get that there must be a definition? Remember, we can't use Cauchy's theorem or anything like that. Now, one thing which might be useful is to say, well, look, we have the unit disk D over here. You give me a curve over here, I can map that to a closed curve here. And now I can do things in the disk. And maybe I can somehow use that to draw back to over there. So I'll let you think about this as to whether or not, if I take the punctured disk, I have an issue. Okay? But, you know, again, there's a reason why we spend time in this semester building up all of these results, is we want to now understand these different maps. So I do a lot of work in analytic number theory. And in analytic number theory, one of the big things we study is the function <coughs> e to the x. Or better yet, we actually study the function e to the 2 pi i x. And there's a very nice property this function has. What property does this function have? It's periodic. So if we let t of x be x plus 1, then e to the 2 pi i t of x equals e to the 2 pi i of x. So in other words, the function is invariant if I apply t. This leads to Fourier series. This leads to a lot of great results. Is that we can decompose our function in terms of sines and cosines. What's really going on is we have a function that transforms nicely with respect to a set of motions, with respect to the set of translations. So exponential is nice with respect to translations. The whole point is we want to study more general functions that are nice relative to other properties. And so what we'll have is SL2R is the set of all matrices A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D are real numbers. And A, D minus B, C equals 1. It turns out you can define a very good definition of a matrix acting on a complex number. So, if you've never seen this before, what's the most natural way to define a matrix acting on a complex number? Yes? 
Do so. X Y. Oh, because we could write Z as X and I and Y, and then just look at it as AX plus BY, CX plus DY. That's one thing we could try. What's another thing we could try? Most natural thing, matrix act with a number after it. I'm sorry? I don't want to do a specific number. If you take a matrix and you multiply it by a number, multiply, the multiply every entry by the number. We don't do either of those natural things. What we do is we call this AZ plus B over CZ plus D. That is our definition of a matrix acting on a number. Mathematicians can define anything they want. The question is, is this a useful thing to define? It turns out, yes. Okay. These are very good maps to define. We'll spend a lot of time studying these maps and looking at what they do in different spaces. But as soon as you see this definition, you should have some thoughts. If I give you two matrices, M1, M2 of Z, well, this will give me a new complex number, and then I can do this. What do you think that's the same as? M1, M2 applied to Z. And the proof of this is one word. Magic. Yes, yeah, so how do you spell magic? A L G E B R A. Magic. Right? No, just roll up your sleeves and do the algebra. Right? You know how to multiply two matrices. Multiply the matrices and see what you get. And then just do it in two steps over there. So because we have nice properties of matrices, these maps should have nice compositional properties. We will do a lot with maps like this. And so it turns out that the exponential function is actually a very special case of good functions. So if I give you the matrix T is 1, 1, 0, 1, <coughs> T of Z would be 1, 1, 0, 1 acting on Z. That would be Z plus 1 over 1 is Z plus 1. So it turns out that this is basically just saying it works nicely with respect to this matrix T. There's another matrix that's really useful called S. And there's two definitions of S. I never remember which one I should use. They don't really matter. And S is defined as 0, 1, negative 1, 0. You could flip where the minus 1 is without it really mattering. S of Z is going to be uh, 1 over negative Z. It turns out these two matrices are very nice. Over here, I've looked at SL2 of R. These are matrices with real entries. Instead of looking at matrices with real entries, what else could I look at? Matrices with what entries? C. I'm sorry? I could do imagine. I could do SL2C, but that's making life even harder. So what could make things easier, rather than looking at real numbers? Rationals, but even nicer than rationals? Integers. It turns out any matrix that's 2 by 2 with integer entries is some copies of T and T's inverses and S and S inverses. So the matrix C's S and T generate SL2Z. And so if you want to try to understand the effect of an arbitrary transformation in SL2Z, all you have to understand is what's going on with SL with uh, T and Z. Uh, T and S. So let me just state this. This is a good time to end and this is a chance to recall a fact from linear algebra, which sadly you have almost really forgotten. But SL2Z is generated by the matrices S and T. So this means look at all finite combinations of S, T, and their inverses. You give me anything in SL2Z, I can write it as some string of S's and T's. And their inverses. This should remind you of elementary matrices from linear algebra. When you're trying to prove certain things like Gaussian elimination, you have these elementary row exchanges, elementary column exchanges, all those things. And you build a general matrix from these simpler steps. And so if you want to understand the general case, you just have to understand what's going on for these simple building block matrices. 
That's exactly what we get with something like this. If we want to understand how something behaves under transformations from SL to Z, we just have to understand how it behaves under S and T. Okay, so what we're going to do on Wednesday is we will continue and we'll now look at a bunch of different examples of conformal equivalences. We'll do a lot of different maps. And then once we start doing that, hopefully we'll have time to conjecture what the Schwartz lemma is. And then, of course, my question will always be what? So Schwartz lemma is a lemma in complex analysis. The natural question will be...